All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today for this uh, Silence and Tell Us joint presentation of Be Happy Even When Skies Are Gray. When we say be happy even when skies are gray, what we're talking about is sort of the, over, uh, the overwhelming and growing threat to the gray list. It's something that's been uh, <clears throat> not talked about so much in the security industry, and we, it's something that we think uh, deserves a bit more time and a bit more effort to uh, discuss and bring out to the open. Uh, on our webcast today, we have the Chief Knowledge Officer, Dr. Shane Shook at Silence, and Chris Harms, who is our Senior uh, Product Director. Uh, they'll both be talking about two different aspects of the, uh, of the gray list and how to approach it. Uh, Dr. Shane Shook will be uh, featuring the pre-response compromise assessment, and Chris Harms will be talking about something that we're proud of here at Silence. Uh, it's a new tool that actually gives you insight into that gray list. So with that, I will go ahead and uh, hand you over to Dr. Shane Shook, and we'll take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Ryan, for that. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and I'm uh, happy to be talking with you from uh, an overcast Seattle, um, which is uh, coincidental to the subject of this uh, discussion. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our pre-response compromise assessment uh, in regard to the gray list and uh, see if we can provide some context around um, the issue of cybersecurity uh, risks and threats. And then, uh, as Ryan mentioned, we'll hand it over to my uh, colleague uh, Chris, who will talk more specifically about the gray list and what it means in terms of detective type uh, technologies and uh, a really uh, fantastic uh, technology that we've evolved at Silence um, that cuts through um, the, uh, the chaos of identifying malware based on uh, uh, machine learning uh, intelligence instead of uh, simple uh, signature based uh, sorts of detections. So to, to start, I want to provide a bit of perspective uh, from history and experience. There's an old uh, formula that's always been used in business to uh, articulate um, risk uh, for risk management purposes of, of business issues. And, and that formula basically is that risk is equal to um, threat times impact and sometimes divided by time depending on who you uh, discuss the risk with. And now, in uh, the cybersecurity industry, uh, as it's grown up to be known, um, there's generally this concept of cybersecurity threats. And unfortunately, um, that's the context that's thrown around when discussing cybersecurity issues. Um, the problem that I've come to understand in discussion with risk management uh, executives at companies, including the CFOs, the CIOs, and the CEOs, is when they try to contextualize to their shareholders and boards uh, and within their organization these issues of cybersecurity, um, the concept of threat gets lost in the inability to discuss it in terms that have meaning. And that fundamentally, as I've learned, is because um, there is no impact that can be qualified uh, with regard to technical indicators of compromise. Um, Rather, the impact is something that comes contextually from reviewing what has happened, when it happened, and what sort of uh, impact it actually has on the business in terms of brand and identity uh, management in the marketplace, um, shareholder confidence uh, due to financial impacts or brand impacts, litigation, and other issues. And so we've uh, developed a different approach to cybersecurity um, assessments, including this compromise assessment methodology, uh, that coincidentally also works to contextualize incident response um, activities and uh, findings so that we can have and promote a discussion with um, our customers and our clients uh, that they can carry uh, contextually to their executive peers so that in a cybersecurity incident, um, issues that have meaning are communicated rather than technical indicators that have meaning to just a few technical uh, people in the organization. So what I'm going to describe and, and sort of demonstrate in, in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes is uh, an approach to cybersecurity assessment and particularly assessing 
uh, past or current compromises um, that can help articulate uh, to management uh, issues of compromise and what they reflect in terms of threats and risks in a spectrum to be considered. When we come into a compromise uh, situation, whether it's an audit as an assessment uh, or an incident response, um, it, it's important to prioritize uh, what we're looking for because what we're looking for will actually dictate uh, who our stakeholders are that we need to communicate with and what type of approach will be uh, projected and um, actually funded by the organization uh, to pursue a resolution of. And from experience, the most important um, issue that an incident response team or a compromise assessment audit uh, needs to focus on is the issue of data loss or potential sabotage. And that's of fundamental importance and much more important than the indicators that are typically sought uh, by incident responders uh, historically, uh, such as malware or um, anomalous or malicious communications that meet signature-based detection in technologies like IDS or antivirus or anti-malware. Rather, the, the more important and actually most important, as I've come to learn, um, issue that needs to be focused on first is data loss or sabotage. This is what I've learned directs the rest of the uh, activities in an incident handling team or an audit uh, resolution. After it's been determined whether there's been data loss or potential sabotage like logic bombs or et cetera, um, the next most important uh, issue uh, that I found to be productive in, in uh, assessing is a very simple concept called user profile propagation. And I say very simple because fundamentally everyone that has a laptop or a desktop computer has uh, a user profile on that computer. This issue that we look for is to determine how many other computers in the corporate environment that user profile exists on and where and when it was created. So for example, in Silence, in our corporate environment, I have a laptop that has my user profile on it. There's one other system that I interact with on a shared space. Now, only those two computers should have my user profile. If I find that any other computers in the environment have my user profile on them, I really want to know why and how it was used and when it was created and what that subsequent use was. We call that user profile propagation and it's an extension of user profile abuse, which is a primary consideration of information security uh, control for a number of different control standards. Um, Moving on from the user profile propagation as the second priority that we look for um, is how the user profiles get uh, to the other systems, and we call that lateral movement. On a priority basis, data loss, user profile propagation, and lateral movement uh, are activities that reflect a loss of control in the managed estate of the corporate enterprise. And because of a loss of control, that type of activity and the manipulation of those systems without authorization, those types of activities represent threat-based uh, activities that can actually impact the business. Uh, they can impact the business by allowing unrestricted access to then steal or manipulate data or sabotage the environment. Uh, so of course, we've all read a lot about data loss, data theft, um, issues like uh, trillions of dollars of intellectual capital being stolen annually from uh, businesses uh, through cyber breaches. Uh, issues like Shamoon uh, or um, Stuxnet that sabotage uh, operating environments. Um, and those types of issues are promulgated by unrestricted access or unregulated control and manipulation of the enterprise environment. And those activities represent threats much more than risks. And so when we talk about detective techniques in cybersecurity, in order to qualify threats versus just identifying risks, we want to talk in context of gray areas that detective technologies that are based upon signatures 
are incapable of identifying. And that comes to our methods and our technologies that I'm going to uh, spend some more time delving into. Now, I certainly don't want to ignore the risk indicators that are so useful in uh, tipping us off to other activities of interest. Um, so these risk indicators are things that we've all heard about and are the typical and historical uh, precedent of approach, which are malware and indicators of compromise, as they're called. Now here, we don't want to restrict ourselves to looking for malware based on signatures uh, because we know that there are always going to be more malware variants and evolutions uh, than there will ever be signatures uh, capable to detect. Instead, we want to look at what constitutes malware, whether it's a malicious file that's been programmed by a third party in one of the former Soviet republics or uh, hacktivists or the like uh, intentionally as malware or what we found to be more common legitimate tools that are being used for malicious purposes to provide access to environments and to abrogate other security controls. We want to be able to identify malware by, based on its indicators of compromise which again are going to be uh, activities that create risks to facilitate unregulated access and manipulation or control of the environment. So we'll talk some more about that. And then finally, a risk activity we found in our approach that has a lot of meaning to our, our clients is the sheer and literal inconsistency of deployed applications and operating systems and environments that because of the inconsistency, um, it creates vulnerabilities that can be exploited by attackers. So here we're not talking about things like CVEs that are recognizable by patterns in much the same way that um, uh, antivirus signatures can recognize known malware. Rather we're talking about the sheer fact of inconsistencies in applications that are commonly targeted for exploit like um, internet browsers, uh, office applications, uh, uh, framework applications like .NET and Java and so forth, and the operating systems themselves. It's that sheer inconsistency that creates the vulnerability for exploitation that is a risk. So this is the overview, if you will, of what we address with the compromise assessment under this process that we call pre-response, which is a preventative response um, to addressing uh, cybersecurity issues and articulating them in the context of threats, which are activities that can impact the business, or risks, which are indicators that may represent or point to activities that could threaten the business. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Verizon uh, did a data breach report uh, last year and it provided some useful context in this discussion. Uh, for the companies that um, contributed uh, results to the report, 69% um, of those companies identified that some form of malware was used. Um, now, saying some form of malware, that represents um, both uh, malware that was intentionally created for malicious use, such as viruses, worms, dropper downloaders and backdoor trojans, as well as utilities that are off the shelf like PSExec or VNC or uh, backdoor uh, type proxies like LogMeIn or even uh, administrative tools like uh, Microsoft RDP and so forth that are being used for malicious purposes. Um, what this also means that some 31% of the breaches that were reported did not use uh, any type of actual malware. Now there is some confusion in the statistics. More generally from the last uh, eight years or so of uh, tracking these types of activities through investigations, I've come to learn that uh, more than 60% of the time no recognizable uh, malware has been used in the breaches that I've investigated. And this is in several hundred investigations that I've conducted, including things like uh, Night Dragon, Comanche Crew, uh, Shamoon, um, a variety of botnet compromises and so forth that I've uh, uh, 
had the advantage um, of, of participating in the investigations on. Um, instead, um, most of the time we find that uh, legitimate tools or tools that are otherwise legitimate are being used in ways uh, that uh, are malicious and serving the purposes of accessing to uh, make use of the environment in unregulated and unauthorized uh, uh, reasons and purposes. In the same report, uh, some 89% of the uh, companies that reported identified that some form of hacking was used. Now again, the, the converse is that some 11% of the same are saying that no form of hacking was used. And what that comes down to is some of the subsequent um, uh, uh, statistics like social engineering where things like honey drops or um, fake help desk calls and so forth were used to actually gain access to the environment. So these statistics are informative. Uh, at the least in identifying and, and understanding that signature-based te technologies uh, are always going to leave a very large gray list. And that's what we focus on both in our compromise assessment and the technology that my co colleagues can articulate uh, is identifying the gray list of tools and activities that represent um, the risks and threats of cyber issues in the environment. Now we've got a process in our, that we follow called a pre-spons. It's a three-phased approach to identifying the activities and the indicators that represent those threats and risks in, uh, to the businesses that we uh, serve. Um, if you will, on the uh, left-hand side of uh, your screen, you see there are two triangles. The left side triangle is what we face as incident responders or auditors when we come into an incident. Uh, effectively, we come in with zero or very little understanding of the IT environment and the indicators representing uh, potential risks or activities. But by the end of our approach, we've got to have 100% or a comprehensive coverage of the environment in, under, in order to understand the scope of the risks and vulnerabilities and the scope of the activities that have been performed both malicious intentional activities as well as perhaps insider uh, suspicious activities that need to be reviewed. The, the converse triangle, the upside down triangle, represents that the scope of the investigation of the audit that we need to perform is 100% of the managed state. But we recognize that we've always got limited and very expensive resources to employ to conduct the type of analysis that gets us a comprehensive scope in our investigation. So we've constructed a process and a method of analysis that uh, takes into account the need to cover the entirety of the environment with consideration of the limited resources that are very expensive. And this is what we call pre spots The three phases uh, at the high level are a diagnostic assessment using tools that already exist in the environment, so no new, new tools. Uh, as a phase one to address the entirety of the estate in an efficient data collection effort. The second phase, uh, we employ um, uh, some forensic utilities uh, in order to capture metadata that allows us as security responders or incident analysts to uh, construct a forensic timeline of activities and indicators that is comprehensive and supported with forensic detail without uh, acquiring full disk in memory images. So um, the phase one approach allows us to address the entirety of an estate in order to identify what we call systems of interest. And those systems of interest uh, from experience usually shake out to be about 1% of the environment. So out of 100,000 systems in a managed estate, for example, we will typically find about 1,000 systems have some anomalies in their configuration or use history that mean that we need additional assessment or phase two efforts in order to understand what that activity is. Now 1,000 systems is still too many to collect uh, full forensic detail and disk copies of and we may be prevented by um, uh, safe harbor 
and other jurisdictional issues from collecting that type of information remotely. So we've constructed a more um, efficient method of collecting just the metadata with forensic integrity that allows us to construct a comprehensive timeline for analytical purposes so that then we can identify those few hosts that either risk management policy dictates that we need to collect full disk images of as phase three um, or we simply need more technical detail. And I'm going to articulate those a little bit more. So in our phase one uh, diagnosis or diagnostic phase of the assessment, uh, fundamentally we recommend that you don't deploy another agent. There are plenty of agents already out there for uh, assessing risks and, and threats. So make use of the agents that already exist, including fundamentally the capabilities that exist on every operating system ever deployed. Those are things like directory listings, uh, operating si system service lists like task lists, uh, launch control, etc. Um, scheduled tasks, uh, build configuration information like system info or registry settings, um, event logs and user history, and then some stateful network information. These are capabilities that exist on every system already. And if you grab that data in its native format and compress it, we've learned that it usually represents only about 5 to 10 megabytes of data per system. That when we bring it back and cull it and parse it into a database, we can apply some traditional data analytic techniques of frequency analysis and specific detective uh, techniques to isolate activity indicators and recognizable um, attributes or indicators of compromise related to files, system settings, registry use, and communications. Um, however, coincidentally, we don't want to ignore the other information that's already being collected by the variety of tools in use in your uh, uh, security onion, if you will. Um, those other technologies that have been deployed have value, and we want to maximize that value and add additional value through the context that we can gain from the comprehensive assessment with this diagnostic situation. So antivirus, anti-malware, uh, HIPS, SAM, uh, change management, IDS, those all have very valuable uh, pieces of information that can be coincidentally correlated to the type of information we request without deploying any additional agents. And we don't want to ignore that. However, at the same time, we have to recognize that we're just doing a diagnostic of the managed estate with the utilities already deployed. So we don't want to rely too much on that. Instead, we want to limit our reflection of the value of that data to identifying systems of interest. So just boiling down 100% of the estate through this diagnostic method very quickly and efficiently with efficient process to then get to our phase two, which allows us to assess more specifically what typically is about 1% of the environment. In the second phase, we want to collect the metadata from, those, from the managed state, those systems of interest. Um, and here the metadata uh, will provide us, as long as the forensic detail is uh, maintained uh, will provide us with the comprehensive file contents like the event logs, registry logs, uh, user histories, and the MFT records, um, the comprehensive details that are otherwise not visible in the detail that we collect in phase one. Coincidentally, we want to gather the, the stateful information as well. Then again, we want to parse this efficiently so that we can address a volume of information in an efficient manner and apply some smart data analytic methods to extract a timeline that will help us understand the activities that represent the threats and the indicators based on the, uh, uh, the types of indicia, uh, the settings made to the registry, the operating system components being used coincidentally, and even the file system locations and names that represent uh, other malware and indicators of compromise. So we can identify from this morass of gray intelligence um, those threat-based activities and risk-based indicators that have meaning to help us uh, communicate with management 
the scope of the incident in time, the impact of the incident in terms of systems affected, and interpret with uh, management's assistance then what impact it may have on the business that shareholders and executives need to be aware of. Then the third phase uh, is where, again, only where situational requirements uh, would dictate, like risk management or legal policies, that we must collect a full forensic image for retention purposes, or when we need more technical detail um, that we can't otherwise get just from metadata uh, to understand the types of indicators and potential um, uh, risks related to uh, things like the data loss or um, the use of logic bombs or other utilities that we otherwise couldn't get. There we want to do a full disk and forensics collection. Now a little context. Uh, um, uh, I recently did a case for a, a large technical company, um, industry leader. They had 137,000 systems under management in their state, a variety of Windows, Linux, Mac, AIX, and so forth. Um, and I did a phase one, two, and three uh, approach to it. Um, just to provide some context, because of the efficiencies in our process, um, we were able to do with two people in three weeks uh, a full phase one, two, and three um, definition of what had occurred to articulate a, a full breach as well as uh, policy violations of internal users uh, to understand the extent of uh, what was an extensive uh, APT incident uh, that had been going on for more than 12 months. Out of the 100, 137,000 systems of a variety of operating systems, we deployed no new agents. We simply asked with SCCM, in their case, uh, a set of DOS commands and Linux commands and shell commands, uh, uh, a set of questions of the utilities already on those systems. We pulled that data back. It averaged about 5 megabytes per system across the managed estate, parsed it into a database. Within a couple of days, with only two people, we were, we were able to identify 4,500 systems out of the 137,000 that had indicators recognizable of uh, compromise or malware, and we were able to identify the behaviors like the lateral movement, the misuse of user profiles through their propagation and anomalous use in time and geography, uh, and coincidental uh, data from uh, uh, IDS and firewall and VPN logs, uh, as well as uh, anomalous packaged files and exfiltration of data through systems, we were able to identify all of those activities through phase one and phase two in less than 10 days with two people across an estate of 137,000 systems. Out of that entirety, we only had to do forensic review, a phase three review um, of five systems. And two of those were to gain more technical understanding of the utilities that were used. And the other three were related to risk management because those three systems uh, had facilitated or been the base from which data was harvested and exfiltrated. So I hope that helps to contextualize that we were able to help that company with an efficient process in less than three weeks with only two people address the entirety of their estate through this process. And that was not unique. Uh, we've done this um, uh, many times now. I've done it more than 50 times for Fortune 2000 clients uh, over the space of the past few years. And specifically with Silence, we've adapted and improved this approach for several dozen of those companies with similar results. Now when we talk about this, um, one of the other advantages is a phase that we call our phase four. It's not part of our, our communicated three phases of effort because this is a remedial phase. Uh, we don't believe that uh, simply assessing and identifying uh, risks and threats for a client is of any use unless we can do a knowledge transfer to help them prevent these activities. And this is what we call our phase four. The same types of activities that can be identified as threat activities 
uh, from the issues like data loss and sabotage, uh, profile propagation and lateral movement, as well as the way that malware and other indicators of compromise um, can be uh, identified in how they've been uh, deployed or in instanced in the environment can re relate um, specific recommendations to that uh, client. So rather than bringing back generic recommendations around um, best practices that industry recommends, we can take the results of our assessment and our analysis from our method and our active discussion with our client to bring back monitoring, alerting, and preventative recommendations that are specific to the environment that we have assessed rather than simply relating generic recommendations to prevent these same types of activities from occurring and also to help them get ahead of the kill chain uh, in case we've interrupted a, set, a series of advanced persistent threat activities. So just to uh, summarize, our pre-spawns compromise assessment methodology is to help address the gray area of understanding between cyber threats and risks. The difference, uh, that fundamental difference between threats and risks is threats are reflective of activities that mean that the client has no uh, capability to control the unrestricted access and manipulation of their environment or the loss of data from their environment. Those are threat-based activities. Uh, and risks, like vulnerable systems due to inconsistencies deployed in the environment that are not being managed or patched in a comprehensive manner, either because they cannot be due to certain uh, limitations of the operating technology, or they have not been due to oversight um, or um, uh, loose policies of configuration management and control, or simple malware distribution and effects of um, user uh, education uh, limitations or issues. So pre-response is a process. It's not another endpoint agent tool or scanner. Rather, it's a method of approaching and differentiating for the client um, the risk of vulnerabilities and malware indicators of compromise and the threats of the activities that can be facilitated by those types of utilities. And we, in our, in our process of analysis, start by identifying what's most important to management, not what's most sensational. It's always interesting to identify malware, but if all you're doing is identifying malware and communicating that you found malware, you're overlooking the threat activities. And our approach, both with our technology and our processes is to help customers learn what matters. Malware doesn't matter as much as unrestricted access and uncontrolled use. Malware can facilitate that, so it's important to find it. But it's most important to find it in intelligent means, just like the activities that relate to it. And what's happening now is more important than what happened in the past, so it's important to have a priority-based approach to communicating with the incident handling team and management the results of the analysis. And that's fundamentally because attackers use Corp IT utilities much more often than malware. So it's important to look for activities that represent the use of the corporate environment as well as the use of uh, malware that facilitates that access and manipulation of the environment because risks are not the same as threats. At this point, I want to introduce uh, my colleague Chris Harms. Excuse me. He's a, our director of uh, uh, product management. Uh, and he's going to give a, a great um, uh, introduction to our technology that helps to address uh, all of this gray area that I've described. Uh, Chris has a fantastic background with some of the, um, the most recognizable names. I'll let him. Uh, describe more of that. He's, he's personally uh, contributed to a lot of the same types and same investigations uh, that I mentioned that I've had the experience with as well. So um, uh, at this point, Chris, welcome. Shane, thanks for the, uh, the great intro here. And I'm just going to get my screen shed, uh, set up for, uh, for us. And we 
should be uh, good to go. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for um, uh, for that uh, great information. I love to see that that process explained. And um, you know, I think uh, I I, I want to take the opportunity. Uh, I'm happy that you uh, invited me to just talk a little bit about what we're doing on the product side to kind of help uh, help work this pyramid, this kind of defense in depth. Uh, investigative strategy that that you've got, got put together, and I'm 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 using one of your slides here that I stole from you uh, because I, I wanted to, to pinpoint where Silence's product uh, fits into uh, this entire strategy. And what I love about this pyramid is you get to see from the, the base uh, where the problem can arise, and then as you walk up the pyramid, uh, without having that defensive strategy, without having those those protection technologies in place and the failures of security, you can quickly see how a risk becomes a threat to the business. Where, where Silence's products have focused uh, is really on that stage four right now, uh, which is the, 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 the malware specific piece, right? And our goal is as an attacker walks up this pyramid from five to four, getting inside the network, two, three, moving around to two, stealing profiles and becoming a, a, a new user, someone else they're not, and then one certainly uh, grabbing data and sabotaging, anything we can do to stop that progression up the pyramid, right, add friction. Imagine we're standing on the top and we're throwing boulders down, right? That's kind of what our job as defensive, uh, uh, defensive engineers and security practitioners are. So we wanted to add a major friction point into number four for the malware, right? AV and, and a lot of the other technologies have really failed us at this point. And really it's become a really small stepping stone for attackers to bypass a lot of these technologies. And at Silence, uh, this, is, this is where we've, we've been focusing, right? Now, before I, I get into how we're doing it, I wanna elaborate a little bit more on the problem specifically for this, this layer four area, right? And if you think about the, all the software that exists on inside an enterprise, right? Let's assume that we, we can account for and we know the answer to every question we wish we did as security practitioners. And we'll say, there's a malicious group of software, I have that represented on the left, and that's, that's gonna be in the environment that might be one piece, it might be 10 pieces, who knows? And then there's also the legitimate software that's in there. And, and that's the good and that's represented in the green. Now the challenge, right, has always been for practitioners to start on the outside and work your way in so there's nothing that's unknown running in your network, right? And we've done this through a variety of technologies, right? The first try that we had with is our signature-based uh, technologies and some of the defensive strategies. And if you look at technologies like AV, you'll find in most of the statistics that are out there, they say that AV is about 20%, um, you know, detection rate on, on the first day, maybe even less, right? I don't know. You know, I'm not, I don't want to argue over where the numbers sit. It's probably all depending on, um, you know, a whole lot of factors, right? But what we know it's not is we know it's not 100% or else we wouldn't be having this on the On the flip side, we've also tried to, to take the software knowledge uh, and push all the way to the 100 for the good, right? And that's through using things like whitelisting technology, you know, your Bit9, your Maxi uh, application controls, and et cetera. And I'd say for some system types, uh, those can be in, uh, effective, right? If you're looking at systems that don't change, maybe their their manufacturing systems or or point of sales devices, even um, with low low rates of change, then those technologies uh, tend to do okay. Um, certainly, they have their own issues when you get into um, you know some of the the different types of attacks. But what we did find was the sheer volume of software, both bad and good, that's being created every day has created a real challenge for this whitelisting uh, issue, and we weren't able to get good coverage of our entire enterprise. So while we may be able to cover servers and point of sales devices, certainly we can't cover desktop. So what we're left with is, is what we call the gray list, this huge amount of software that's coming into the enterprise every day that we use to do business, and that's in the form of patches, um, new software that users are downloading, and, and malware that's being created. And determining what, how to separate that gray list has been essentially the, the issue in the industry. If we knew and could ca correctly categorize every piece of running executable code in our environment, the, the pyramid 
uh, the, the attacker walking up that pyramid, well, that becomes a very different story, right? There's a lot. It becomes a very vertical pyramid with a lot of friction um, and a lot of issues uh, uh, created for the attacker. So that's been our goal uh, here at Silent. So um, even, uh, and I, um, I'm just jumping in, you know, you've seen other uh, technology like Sandbox is trying to close this gap as well, and, and we know we still haven't gotten there yet. And, uh, and this is where essentially D6. Um, now, one of the things I am going to mention is in order to try and close the rest of that gap, uh, occasionally there has to be a sacrificial lamb, right? That's the, the issue with signature-based technology. You have to have seen it before you know it's good. And at Silence, we, we joke around that V is for vegan because we, 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 don't, we don't need a sacrificial lamb in order to tell you whether or not a file is good or bad. Um, so that's kind of where, uh, where we sit today. And the way that we're doing this uh, is called machine learning. And for those of you guys who aren't uh, uh, familiar with machine learning, um, we're not actually the first people to use machine learning to revolutionize uh, an industry. Uh, it's happened inside of the financial uh, folks. It's happened uh, with Siri and Xbox, uh, you know, to tell the difference between a hand and a head. Um, it's even uh, uh, been done in Netflix and, and Target, right? Marketing. So really machine learning has had a massive impact on a variety of uh, different uh, areas uh, in other industries, and we're bringing that, that knowledge, uh, knowledge into the security space. Um, so when we talk about what that is, uh, you know, we get a lot of questions like, well, what does that really mean? You know, put us in a bucket, right? So I'm going to tell you what buckets we're, we're not in when we talk about uh, the ability to define good from bad. We're not a signature-based technology. We're not using indicators of compromise or intelligence. We're not using heuristics uh, like the AV uh, companies do. We're, we're non-execution-based. We're also non-behavioral, and we're not using virtual machines. Uh, the Infinity platform, which is our research platform for machine learning, is actually uh, an artificial intelligence. And I know that sounds a little sci-fi, uh, but it's true. And the, the invention and, and, I guess, implementation of things like cloud computing have allowed us in the last um, you know, year or two to bring this into the space. Um, we're predictive and future-focused. And like I said, we're machine learning-based. Uh, and Infinity is actually just our cloud research platform. So when you hear cloud, don't think that we're tying you to the cloud. It's just our research platform. In fact, the output is a mathematical model which we can move around uh, in enterprise, very lightweight, and it, it's in the same architecture uh, model. It fits it within the same architecture model as an AD, meaning I don't have to suck all your data into our cloud in order to tell you whether or not I think something is good or bad. So. So to walk you through at a high level how we do this, essentially we do a massive data collection. We break the data into good or bad based on a variety of other means, right, downloading things from MSDN, using, um, you know, other uh, antivirus technologies and, and things that have been used in the past, and we break them down into, into um, good or bad buckets, and then we dive into and extract features out of each of these individual files. And so as traditionally as responders, what we would do, and Shane and I are, 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 are experts at this, is knowing where to look in, inside of a file and be able to tell, uh, based on what we see, whether or not we think that file is good or bad. So what we're actually doing on the product side is we're flipping the script a little bit on that. And we're, we're extracting features in an unbiased way. And we're making the assumption that analysts and humans, when looking at malware, are not capable of processing the sheer number of, of elements and, and, and items that might make up a malware in a statistically relevant way. So we're, we're kind of challenging that, that notion that a human is better at, at identifying malware than a, than a machine. And um, after we extracted these features, and when I say features, we're talking about, we're looking at files, uh, portable executable specifically, EXE files and DLLs, et cetera, uh, we're looking at over 750,000 different features, different ways to look at the file. And when we first started doing this, we plotted this on a graph, and that's what you see up there on the left-hand corner. You see this kind of two-dimensional blob. It's actually a three-dimensional graph um, with, with space in it, but this is where we, we ended up. Now, then the data scientists went to work, and their goal was to take that known good and that known bad and start breaking and creating space in between them, mathematically speaking. And it turns out you can do this. 
which is actually which is really exciting. Uh, so our data scientists have been able to essentially draw a three-dimensional line, and when we look at files that come in, based on where they sit on the graph, we can tell you if it's good or bad. And not only that, we can also start doing something called clustering, which is finding out, oh, it's not only bad, but it also looks exactly like zero access from a feature perspective. Or it looks good, and it reminds us of MSDN uh, software or software compiled by Oracle, right? Um, you know that specifically Microsoft has a very um, detailed way that they release software. Um, so this is essentially uh, what we at, at Silence on the product team have been doing. We've been trying to create, or we have created, um, a mathematical model that can discern good from bad. And that means that gray list, that unknown software that you find today, we can tell you whether or not that looks good or that looks bad and how confident we are in that market. And that changes the whole element of how we look at malware as an industry perspective because I don't have to have seen the file or the piece of malware to know whether or not it has good tendencies or bad tendencies. So we've really brought a statistical relevance to this type of decision, which is very exciting. Uh, what that means from a technology perspective is uh, we've, we're bringing, we have brought actually two technologies to market and we're working on a third. Um, the first one is Private Detect and that's a free tool today. Uh, it is kind of like a, um, it's an installer that you put on your system. Uh, it's silent and it essentially just scans your system and, uh, and can tell you with uh, machine learning and and some other cloud-based uh, AV type technologies in the background, whether or not something's good or bad. It's not really a great representation if you're looking to check out how our technology is actually performing, um, because we've we've done we've we've uh, you know used a, a very non-aggressive model because we're still um, getting out in the marketplace and using it to collect data, and you know it's really consumer focused. Our enterprise version, where we get a little bit more aggressive, is what we're calling uh, Silent B, and we have a uh, a local and a cloud-based uh, model for this. So like I said, if, if you're looking at technology and you're saying, I don't want to ship all that data up to the cloud, no problem. Um, and uh, essentially, what, there's a, a variety of ways that you can apply this technology. Shane has applied this uh, in some of the, the response compromise assessments that we've done. And um, there's command line utilities and a GUI. There's even a folder watcher. Um, so we're supporting a variety of workflows that, um, that enterprises would have to just submit large volumes of, of uh, EXE files and DLL files or potentially go scan an enterprise uh, or monitor the network for them and then be able to tell you whether or not we think something is good or bad. We've even got uh, Python and C-sharp API uh, code for you and have even played around with Splunk. Um, and if you're interested and you're a Splunk user and that rings a bell, I do urge you to reach out to Shane. He's done a really amazing job with some really cool Splunk uh, uh, stuff. Uh, in the, in the um, compromised assessment world, especially integrating that with Infinity. And our flagship product uh, is coming out, will be uh, Enterprise Protect. So this will be a commercial uh, a product, essentially an endpoint uh, protection uh, based product that will use machine learning uh, to differentiate uh, good from bad on your network. So these are, I'm, I'm just hinting at these because obviously you can imagine these are much larger conversations than just about what we talked about. Um, but if these are interesting to you at all, um, I'd love the opportunity to talk, talk to you more, potentially get you a, a demo of Silent D so you can check it out for yourself. And, um, and it looks like uh, that's about, we're coming up on, on all the time that we have. So um, I guess I'd like to wrap this up by just saying uh, thank you guys for joining us uh, very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of TELUS and Silent, um, you know, we... Uh, we uh, hope the best in your, your future defensive uh, uh, strategies. And certainly, if you have any questions uh, about the webinar, um, Irene is available from TELUS. Uh, Shane and myself are available uh, via email as well. And as I said before, if you're looking for a demo, demo or trial of Silence D or you're interested in some of the pre spawn compromise assessment stuff we've talked about, you can certainly get us uh, sales at silence.com and we can point you in the direction. Um, other than that, thank you very much for your time. And uh, again, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll hang out on chat for a little while longer or uh, shoot us an email and we can go from there.